Hey guys, welcome back. <clears throat> it's lesson 38. This is the last official lesson of the semester. Remember, lesson 39 is going to be the final uh, diagnostic exam. It's called the QMAT. Um, I want you guys to try your best to perform well on that because I'm, I'm using that as a, uh, a gauge of how I'm doing. And in addition, uh, the harder you try, the better understanding you'll have of how, you, uh, how you're really doing in preparation for the final. Remember, the final will have, in addition to uh, detailed workout problems, it will also have a significant uh, qualitative component, a multiple choice component, that uh, will be based on the kinds of clicker questions and, and the kinds of questions that will be asked on this, uh, on this assessment. So it should be a good gauge for you. All right, today we're looking at quantum computing. In order to understand quantum computing, we need to have this idea of a qubit. A qubit is a two-state system that, that sort of is analogous to a bit in a conventional classical computer. The uh, two-state system, you guys know, is a system that has two quantum states and, uh, in general, exists in some kind of a superposition state uh, with coefficients uh, amplitudes for the two states, uh, A and B. Now the thing is A and B are not without restrictions. The sum of the magnitudes of A and B squared has to be 1. And also uh, an overall phase doesn't matter so that you could multiply A and B by a, the same phase factor and it wouldn't affect the uh, actual physical consequences of being in a particular state. And that means that we can rewrite the state in terms of two real numbers, theta and phi. You'll recognize these as simply the, the two real numbers that specify the direction of a spin one-half particle, the direction in which the spin is pointing in space, and, uh, and so you can think of a two-state system as being a spin one-half particle. In other words, a spin one-half is sort of a canonical uh, model of how a two-state system goes. So if you have more than one qubit, then all of a sudden you have the possibility of more uh, coefficients, more combinations of um, spin up and spin down, or ground state and excited state, whatever, whatever the states 0 and 1 are, they, they depend on the physical implementation of the qubit, but um, a, b, c, and d in general are arbitrary, except again the sum of the squared magnitudes has to be 1, because the o probability of being in one of those four possible states has to be one. And also the overall phase of these guys doesn't matter. So for four uh, possible combinations here, there's only three relevant phases. So um, that means in this case, there are gonna be six real numbers instead of only two real numbers. And if you work it out, if you have uh, n qubits, it takes uh, two to the n plus one minus two real numbers to specify the quantum state. To give you an idea of, uh, of how that works, if I have, for example, my uh, laptop has 8 gigabytes of, um, of RAM, and if I want to specify the quantum state of an n qubit quantum computer, uh, assuming that I use one floating point real, you know, IEEE floating point real number, a four byte number, um, that means I get two uh, billion floating point numbers. It works out to be approximately a 30 qubit computer is the largest quantum computer I can simulate using all of the eight gigabytes of RAM in my laptop. So that is a remarkably small number of qubits. Um, and you can see why if you had only uh, 40 qubits or 50 qubits, it would be impossible to simulate the thing fully in any arbitrary quantum state uh, with even the most powerful supercomputer that's available today. So um, it's a different world when you're dealing with a quantum computer. Let's, let's talk about some quantum gates. So what is a one qubit gate? A one qubit gate is uh, a gate that takes a qubit and transfers it or transforms it into a new state. So it takes an old state and it transforms it to a new state. Um, you could think of that as a unitary transformation. Okay, it's a transformation that preserves probability. It's a transformation that uh, has a well-defined inverse. Um, 
And uh, it turns out that in, for all practical purposes, we can think of all the useful gates that we would like to build to make a quantum computer as essentially being uh, reducing to rotations. So you start with a qubit in one case, in one value of theta and phi, and it gets converted into a qubit with a different value of theta and phi. And therefore, all of these uh, one qubit gates can be thought of as a simple rotation. For example, let's think of the not gate. A not gate is a gate that takes the zero state and makes it into the one state. It takes the one state and converts it to the zero state. And uh, that is a unitary transformation that looks like this. If in a vector representation, the uh, state, the generic state is a column vector with a and b as the amplitudes, and it simply flips the amplitudes. Of course, that's nothing other than a rotation about the x-axis. That's our sigma x operator, which we're already familiar with from, from before. So a not gate is simply a sigma x. Um, there's another extremely useful gate we're going to need for the uh, to, to understand the algorithm we're going to study today, and that's the Hadamard gate. A Hadamard gate basically boils down to a 90 degree rotation about the y-axis. Uh, it simply corresponds, it, ta it takes the zero ket and converts it to zero plus one over the square root of two. It takes the one ket and converts it to zero minus one over the square root of two. It's quite easy. Um, notice that if, uh, if you think of 0 and 1 as being spin up and spin down, that these look like plus x and minus x. So these are uh, all you're doing is taking a spin up or a spin down and converting it into plus x and minus x spin in the spin 1 half world. The final gate that might be useful is an arbitrary rotation about the z-axis. That just means we're changing the relative phase of the 0 and the 1 bit. Okay. What about a two input gate? Now the only two input gate we're going to need for today's lesson is called the controlled knot or C knot for short. The controlled knot basically takes uh, 0 0 and makes it into 0 0. It doesn't do anything to 0 0. In fact, if the first bit, if the first qubit is 0, the second qubit is unchanged. So it also converts 0 1 into 0 1. So notice the first qubit is 0, the second qubit doesn't get affected. But if the first qubit is 1, the second qubit is inverted. So that's what the controlled knot does. The first qubit is the control bit. The second qubit is the target bit. If the first bit is 0, nothing happens to the target bit. If the first bit is 1, the target bit gets inverted. That's the idea. The symbol for the C naught looks a little bit like this. Uh, notice that there's this funny circle with a plus sign. That's the XOR operator from uh, digital logic and uh, it basically has the property that if uh, it, it does the controlled inversion. If x is 1 and y is 0 the result is 1. If x is 1 and y is 1 the result is 0. It's exclusive or which means it's x or y except not x and y. So if x and y are both 1 you get 0. If either x or y are 1 you get 1 and if they're both 0 you get 0. So that's the uh, that's the controlled knot. I want to point out that you can use, if you can build a controlled knot, a quantum controlled knot, then you have built an entangler detangler. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you create an unentangled state, run it through the controlled knot, then you produce an entangled state. And if you have an entangled state, you run it through the controlled knot, you get an unentangled state. Let's see how that works. Let's, let's start by applying the Hadamard operator to the first qubit of a two qubit uh, register. This is a, using computer terminology. A register is a series of bits. So in quantum, register is a series of qubits. So we apply the Hadamard operator to qubit 1 and we get uh, 0 minus 1 over the square root of 2. But if I multiply that out, notice it's a superposition of 0, 1, and 1, 1. But this is not an entangled superposition because it's a simple product state. The first qubit is in a definite state. It's in uh, minus x, I guess. And the second qubit is in a definite state. It's in plus z. So uh, there's no entanglement. I could measure the second particle in the z direction, and it would not affect the first particle at all. Um, I could measure the first particle in the x direction. It wouldn't, it wouldn't affect any measurements I would make on the second particle at all. So these are not entangled. But let's see what happens when I run that 
uh, unentangled state through a controlled knot. We'll let the first qubit be the x and the second qubit be the y. That means that the first uh, pair in the superposition uh, suffers no change under the controlled knot because the first qubit is zero. But the second pair, um, the second qubit gets inverted because the first qubit is a one. So when you when you run it through the controlled knot, you go from 0, 1, minus 1, 1 to 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Notice that that's the singlet. That's the uh, so-called D minus state. And uh, it's completely entangled. If I measured the state of particle 1, uh, particle 2 is going to be in the opposite state. So I've affected, uh, I've affected the possible values particle 2 could be measured in. If I measure particle 1 to be um, 1, the second particle is definitely 0. If I measure particle 1 to be 0, the second particle is definitely 1. So th this is completely entangled. But what happens if I run it through the C naught again? Well, again, the first pair doesn't get affected, but the second pair gets flipped right back to where it was. So we're back in the original state, unentangled. So um, the control knot is an entangler detangler. OK, that's one way to think about it. So let's get on to our uh, algorithm. The idea is, what is the quantum problem we're going to solve? So we're going to the, the easiest quantum problem to solve was the first one that was solved. and was solved by a fellow named David Deutsch. And it's called now Deutsch's problem. The idea is you've got a function. It's a binary function of one bit. You put one bit in, you get one bit out. Now the advantage of such a simple function is that uh, there aren't that many of them. In the universe, there are only four possible functions. The inputs can be 0 and 1. One possibility is the output is always 0, regardless of the input. That's the constant 0 function. Another possibility is that when the input is 0, the output is 0. When the input is 1, the output is 1. That's the uh, identity function. It just You just get in, out, whatever you put in. Then another possibility is the input is 1, the output is, or the input is 0, the output is 1. If the input is 1, the output is 0. That's the not function. It takes the, in, the opposite of whatever you put in. And the final possibility is that no matter what you put in, you get out a 1. So that's the constant 1 function. So what is Deutsch's problem? Uh, Dr. Deutsch was interested in finding a problem that a quantum computer could solve faster with less effort than an equivalent classical computer. And so this is the problem he proposed. Problem is, is f of x constant or is it balanced? So the question is, are the outputs uh, independent of the inputs? That would be a constant function. Or are, do the outputs depend on the inputs? That would be a balanced function. So there's two versions of f of x that are balanced, and there's two versions that are constant. And if someone hands me a box that evaluates f of x, um, I don't know how to determine whether it's balanced or constant without evaluating the function at least twice. So here's the trouble. If I plug in f of 0 and get a value out, um, let's say I get out 0. Well, knowing that f of 0 is 0 doesn't tell me f of 1. And so if f of 1 is 0, it would be constant. If f of 1 is 1, it would be balanced. But I can't tell until I evaluate f of 1. Uh, the, the, the possibilities, you know, you can think of 100 ways to try and do it. But in the end, you need to evaluate the function twice. So the classical algorithm, you need to try f of x twice. The quantum algorithm allows you to determine if f of x is balanced or constant um, with only a single evaluation of f of x. Now that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. So let's see how it works. First of all, we have our C naught operator. We're going to modify it slightly for Deutsch's algorithm. And we're going to create what's called the F C naught, which is basically the C naught, except instead of getting the XOR of X and Y in the output qubit, we're going to get F of X and Y. So we're going to build in the evaluation of F of X into the uh, F C naught gate. Now the f c naught gate is only going to actually run once. It's going to we're going to put in a state, and we're going to get out a state. But we're not going to um, do anything else. That's all. That's all it's going to do. It's going to execute one time. 
But uh, how are we going to execute it? We're going to add some machinery to the beginning and end of the FC knot, the front and the back of the FC knot, if you like, in order to do this calculation. So notice, first of all, we've got a couple of Hadamard gates there on the inputs, and we've got a Hadamard gate on the uh, input side of the output of the FC knot. Notice that the, the C knot uh, normally passes one of its inputs through without modification, and uh, the uh, it, you just get X out, and uh, the other output, the bottom output, gets the XOR of X and Y, or in the case of the FC knot, it gets F of X, XOR, Y. Um, we're going to put a Hadamard on that out on the top output to modify what it does. So let's let's look at the state at point A. We we force the inputs uh, to the Hadamard gates to be binary ones. So however we do that, uh, it depends on the system. We force them to be in the uh, one state. We pass the, that input through two Hadamards. So at B, we've got uh, the result of applying the Hadamard gate to bit qubit 1 and the result of applying the Hadamard gate to qubit 2. And when I multiply all that out, I get the following state. So size of B. And this is actually where the magic happens. This is a superposition of all possible combinations of the two inputs. So we're using the Hadamards to force each qubit into a superposition. But if you look at the overall state of the system, it's an unentangled state, but it's an unentangled state of all possible values of both qubits. So this means that the FC not gate in one execution cycle is going to visit all possible combinations of the inputs. And th this turns out to be the deep quantum magic that happens in quantum computers. There are other much more sophisticated algorithms. There's Grover's search algorithm. There's Shor's uh, factoring algorithm. There's a quantum Fourier transform algorithms and so on. But uh, all of these algorithms rely on this feature of quantum mechanics that I can, by uh, applying Hadamard gates to constant values of qubits and uh, looking at the system as a whole, I can generate uh, superpositions of all possible combinations of the inputs. And I can evaluate the result of all possible combinations with a very small number of uh, execution cycles. Okay, so let's keep track of where we are. I want to remind you what the FC naught is up in the upper right. And let's see what happens when the FC naught acts on this state, psi b. I want to pop over to psi c, and I'm going to just write down the answer, and then we're going to go through it term by term. Uh, FC naught acting on 0, 0, what does that do? Well, notice it takes f of x, x is 0, um, and it XORs it with y. But y is 0, so XORing with 0, no matter what f of 0 is, just gives you back f of 0. So that just produces the qubit uh, 0, f of 0. Similarly, the second qubit, um, we've got uh, f of x, so we're going to evaluate f of 1, but we're XORing with y, and y is 0. So again, nothing happens to the result. We just get 1, f of 1. Now the next one is more interesting because this time y is 1. So we're going to evaluate f of x, that's f of 0. But we're going to XOR with 1, which means we're going to take the inverse, or take the not, of f of 0. So I call that f of 0 tilde. Okay. Uh, and finally, the same thing for the last ket. Uh, we're going to evaluate f of 1. But since y is 1 for this ket, we're going to take the not of the result. So here's what we have. We don't know what the function f is, but whatever it is, this is what we're going to get uh, at the end. Now I want to point out something. There are only two possibilities. f can be balanced or f can be constant. If f is constant, that means f0 is equal to f1. So that means um, the first two terms, uh, the qubits the second qubit is the same, and the second two terms, the second qubit is the same. And if you think about that a little bit, you'll realize that that means we can factor this superposition into uh, 0 minus 1 
and f of 0 minus f not, uh, not f of 0. Um, in other words, this is not an entangled state any longer. Uh, in fact, well, in fact, it wasn't an entangled state, but it's it's uh, it's unentangled in this exact way only if f is constant. On the other hand, if f is if f zero is not f one, in other words, f is balanced, then we can factor it a different way. It turns out then we get the first qubit is zero plus the second qubit is one instead of the first qubit is zero minus the sec second qubit is one times the same superposition of f and f naught, or f and not f, I guess. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Notice that the first qubit is in the minus x state, and the second qubit is in the plus x state, uh, depending on whether or not f is constant or f is balanced. So if I run each of these situations through an additional Hadamard gate, then you'll notice that uh, the first qubit comes out 1 if f is constant, and it comes out 0 if f is balanced. So what I've done is to cook up a situation where the input qubit that passes through the uh, f c naught gate comes out 1 only in the situation when f is constant, and it comes out 0 exactly only in the situation when f is balanced. So all I have to do is measure that input register. It's the x register on the output of the f c naught gate, and, uh, and I'll have my answer. If it comes out 1, f is constant. If it comes out 0, f is balanced. Now, I want to point out that the f function was only executed once, although it was executed on a superposition state. But in quantum mechanics, uh, it doesn't take any longer to execute a function, an operator. You apply an operator to a superposition. It doesn't take any longer than it takes to apply to a, uh, an eigenstate. So that means that uh, even though if we were going to calculate that, super, that calculation on a classical computer, it would take longer because there'd be more terms. But it's just nature happening. Nature doesn't happen at a different speed depending on whether or not you're in a superposition or not. So the point is this computer will uh, perform this step, perform this calculation in one cycle. And that's twice as fast as a classical computer could possibly do it. Now it doesn't seem like a huge advantage, especially for such a crazy problem. But the interesting thing is uh, if you apply these ideas to even more sophisticated problems, you get tremendous speed up. So for example, if you're, um, if you're doing a search or you're doing uh, a factoring, that kind of thing, uh, it can, in many cases, you end up with, uh, instead of taking n cycles, it takes the square root of n cycles, for example. And uh, that doesn't seem like a huge improvement, except if it takes a million cycles to do it classically, and you can get it done in a thousand cycles quantum mechanically, that's uh, that's a you know a thousand times faster. So it can it can be many times faster to use a quantum algorithm. And uh, the main point of this whole thing was to give you guys a sense of how that might work, and see how quantum mechanics allows you to do uh, calculations in parallel that would otherwise have to be done. Uh, one at a time, exhaustively. All right, well, that was it. That's the end of this lesson, so we'll see you guys next time. Remember, QMAT on Lesson 39, and uh, preparation final review on Lesson 40, and then the final exam. We'll see you next time.